Welcome to our Tenebrae service. The service is supposed to be solemn and quiet. The reason being, in this service, we are going to reflect on the night that Christ was betrayed and the darkness that he was plunged into within this time. The word tenebrae actually means darkness and shadows. And so what you'll find that throughout the evening, we will have variety of people reading passages that tell the story of that night, from the moment of Christ washing his disciples' feet to the moment of being kissed by a betrayer. As the service continues, the candles will be blown out, and slowly but surely, this place will be plunged into darkness to show that moment when the light of the world was slain by sinful hands. What I encourage you to do at home is also to be quiet. Maybe switch off as many lights as you can so that you yourself are surrounded by darkness. So the only light you see will be what's from your screen and the candles that are around me. As we come into this time together, let us pray. Father, as we reflect on the agony of the cross, as we reflect on the darkness of a friend's betrayal, and all those events of the night before your son was crucified, Lord, we pray that you remind us of the magnitude of this sacrifice. Remind us that this wasn't something that was easy to bear, but it was the Son of God bearing the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders and dying in our place. And so, Father, throughout the service, help us reflect, help us draw close to you, and help us understand a bit more of the magnitude of your sacrifice. And so be with us tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our service will begin with a time of worship. And so as the words are shown on your screen and as the song is played, feel free to just reflect on what is being said. Feel free to sing along. But remember Christ tonight in all that we do.
suffer the effects of that night on which you were betrayed and the next day. And so Lord, we just pray that you bring us to a point of contemplation. Let us remember what it is you went through. And so wherever you are, take some time to be quiet and reflect on what it is Christ did for you.
We are coming into a time that traditionally would be communion. However, tonight we're going to be doing it a bit differently. We'll be having a type of communion liturgy. But what it will be is actually just a chance to reflect and remember on what Christ has done. We'll be doing the same on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so together, let us reflect on what Christ did for us and what started at that last supper that he had with his disciples. That place where he so lovingly washed their feet. And so we reflect on the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where he says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so in whatever way you feel comfortable, whether it be through sharing with the person next to you, whether it be through silent reflection, take some time to remember Jesus and his death and resurrection which brought to you life and forgiveness by the grace of love and the mercy of God our Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit.
are coming to a time within the service now called the Office of Tenebrae. What you will hear through this time is a number of stories read directly from the Bible that tell the full story of what happened to Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. They will be read by various congregants of this congregation. And we will fade to black and you will just see the reference of the passage they are being read. Once that is done, I will then blow out a single candle after each passage, slowly plunging myself and this place into darkness. At the end, I will blow out the central candle, and a time of quiet reflection will then commence. You may stop the video at that point and reflect on this time as much as you would like, but do not switch the video off. After a certain amount of time, I will then relight the central candle, quoting the words from John 1. After that is then lit, the central cross behind me will then be switched on, and the service will be over. I encourage you after that, at home even, maybe even until you go to bed, spend some time in quiet reflection, thinking about what Christ went through and what you heard tonight. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord? Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi? Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for this is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter replied. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I truly tell you, Jesus answered. This very night before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, If I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. It was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Um, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, What's Jesus doing with the foot water? No, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. 
Then Jesus took some bread and some wine, he blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. Then he said, um, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there, I had to say something, so I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you, you can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you'll not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with them and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, and I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. 
Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon? 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they had asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. 
I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting, Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and they, and they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute I, I am a man marked for death and then the next I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. Should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely. This man was the son of God. It is finished.
In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In Him was life. And that life was a light to all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it.